tonight with indoor recreational facilities closed, the city is transforming more outdoor spaces to help people get outside. We put trail systems through every one of our golf courses so you can cross country ski, you can snowshoe, you can come out and walk the golf courses. There's also skating at dozens of rinks across the city and the return of a very popular activity that was first introduced last winter. And we've been pushing from this since the onset of the pandemic. The city prioritizing vaccine shots for education workers in a bid to get kids back in class as scheduled in two weeks. And You've probably heard of the popular furniture store Bad Boy. Well, hundreds of customers are complaining, saying they're not fulfilling orders and selling products that aren't available. I'm Angelina King. I'll tell you about one woman who still hasn't received her furniture after a year and what the company is saying in an interview. That's coming up. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. We'll get to those stories in just a moment, but we begin with tragic news out of Scarborough, where a pedestrian has died in a hit and run. Now, it happened at around 740 near Lawrence and Midland. The pedestrian was found without vital signs and rushed to hospital. They did not survive. Police say the driver fled the scene. Roads in the area were closed for several hours. Anyone who witnessed the accident or has dash cam video is asked to contact police. Well, with tighter restrictions now in place and kids learning from home, the city wants to make it easier for people to get outside. Now, to do that, it's transforming more outdoor spaces into go-to spots for winter fun. From skating to snowshoeing to disc golf, Dahlia Astri has more on the things you can do to keep active during these times. Winter might be shaping up to be fun this year, granted you bundle up. The outdoor winter recreational amenities introduced as part of our Welcome TO Winter Plan are continuing. With many indoor recreational facilities closed due to the latest COVID restrictions, the city says it's making sure people have enough outdoor spaces to stay active and have fun and keep up with traditions. For this group, it's their fourth annual skating reunion at Nathan Phillips. It's nice to be reunited and feel free together here. You, you fell. How, how are you feeling? Yeah, my thing is, is extremely good. This is the first time in my life I'm skating. Yeah, it's the first time. That, yeah. Do you like it or no? Yeah, I like it, but I fall maybe five times. <laughs> There are 50 ice rinks across the city. Now, some of the people I spoke to tonight are pros, but if you're anything like me and taking micro glides and need some lessons, there are lessons provided online at some of the city ice rinks. And maybe you'll become the next Tessa Virtue or Scott Moyer. This year, we were able to reinstate full capacities on the rinks. Uh, remove the requirement for reserve time and change rooms have reopened but at 50 percent. The city is also asking people to avoid hanging around the rinks after skating and if you don't want to glide and instead feel the thrill of flying down a hill there are 26 designated toboggan spots across the city and for those looking for less adrenaline there are almost 300 kilometers of park pathways and trails to wander through the city says it's adding 40 extra locations for walking and hiking this year on top of that several golf courses that usually look like this in the summer will be transformed seven snow loops for walking and snowshoeing at four city golf courses with loops ranging from one kilometer in length to two and a half kilometers in length also available, disc golf, which proved to be very popular when it was first introduced last winter. We expanded that nine hole disc golf course at Scarlet Woods golf course to 18 holes. And we added a nine hole disc golf course at D'Antonio Park golf course this year due to the overwhelming success and popularity of it. And for those itching to hit the slopes, Earl Bales Park and Centennial Park are both set to open on January 15th. Dahlia Ashry, CBC News, Toronto. In a bid to be ready for school to reopen in two weeks, the City of Toronto is prioritizing booster shots for education workers and opening up more vaccine appointments specifically for students and their families. Dale Manukduk has those details. Four vaccination clinics with appointments specifically for education workers. Music to the ears of teachers, even though they've been humming this tune for over 20 months. We welcome this announcement. We've been pushing from this for this since the onset of the pandemic. The clinics will run on January 9th and the 16th and should help more than 3,500 education workers get vaccinated, according to the city. 
The first two clinics will be at Woodbine Mall and Scarborough Town Centre this Sunday. School boards will contact staff directly to help book appointments. The move isn't just being applauded by education workers, but some residents as well, waiting for their boosters at this East York pop-up clinic. It's the right thing to do. I mean, um, I'm sorry it took so long to get here, but glad that we're finally here. They should have been considered one of the high priorities right from the get-go. In addition to the appointments at mass clinics, 27 school clinics will also be operating. Since November 1st, the city has held over 200 school vaccination clinics across Toronto. Those local school-based clinics are for the kids at that school, their family, so their parents or caregivers, and the, the local staff from that school. The city will emphasize clinics in under-vaccinated areas or COVID-19 hotspots. Meanwhile, the province announced it's opening up appointments for education workers as well. Those are available at the International Centre in Mississauga between 4.30 and 8 p.m. starting tomorrow. While prioritizing education workers' access to vaccines will help, at least one teacher's union isn't hopeful the province will hit its January 17th target unless more is done. We need to address the issue of class size. Uh, we see capacity limits on grocery stores and, and malls and a variety of other things. We haven't seen those limits on schools and schools are bursting at the seams with students. To date, 92% of 12 to 17 year olds have received their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine and 88% are fully vaccinated. Meanwhile, children ages 5 to 11, 45% have received their first shot. Dale Minuckduck, CBC News, Toronto. Toronto Public Health confirmed today a child under the age of four died with COVID-19. The agency said it can't release more details due to privacy rules. Severe illness among children remains very rare. Children under the age of five aren't currently eligible to receive COVID-19 vaccines in Canada. Last night, we told you the federal government will be providing 140 million new rapid tests across the country. But until that shipment arrives here in Ontario, the province is rationing the supply we have left. And as Natalie Collada shows us, the demand isn't letting up. The lineup of cars outside U of T's Mississauga campus this morning is long. It's one of several pop-up locations handing out free rapid antigen test kits this week and next. This is our second time lining up for this kit and it's very, very useful for us. With the uh, cases going up, I think it's best if you have like a kit at home so that you could like continuously check in yourself. But today, if you're not working in a high risk setting, Ontario's top doctor says it's a luxury the province can no longer afford given the supply shortage of tests and spread of Omicron. If you have symptoms, so fever and or cough or loss of taste or smell and or the minor symptoms of nasal congestion, uh, headache, that is enough at present to define uh, that you have COVID-19. Ontario is waiting for millions of tests to be delivered and until then the government plans to ration its supply prioritizing rapid tests for those working in high-risk settings like hospitals and long-term care homes and for when schools return to in-person learning. So if you have symptoms compatible with COVID-19, please, uh, you don't necessarily need a test to confirm them. Um, monitor uh, your symptoms once they improve and it's after five days and you're significantly better, you can return uh, to work. Scheduled pop-up rapid test distribution sites like these will continue until next week. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Toronto. Healthcare workers, unions and opposition parties are calling for the government to get back to work. They held a joint news conference this morning to demand the legislature be immediately recalled and Bill 124 repealed. The bill caps a nurse's salary increase at 1% a year. Now, union heads say after two years of the pandemic, many healthcare workers have had enough. Mistakes are happening at the bad side because of burnout, because of short staffing because worsening employment conditions after two years of hell are causing many to utterly collapse. According to the Ontario Nurses Association, the nurse to patient ratio is desperately low with one nurse per 10 patients and it will take the hiring of about 22,000 registered nurses just to catch up. What the province has done in the immediate time is add hospital beds. In an email to CBC News, a spokesperson for the Premier gave no indication the government would recall the legislature or repeal Bill 124. 
well, some GO Transit service disruptions to tell you about. Metrolink says the changes are due to a staffing shortage fueled by the Omicron variant. The transit agency says its frontline teams are currently down by 20 to 30 percent, and it says it expects those numbers to go up in the coming weeks. Metrolink service is being reduced by about 15 percent, adding it's trying to spread out cancellations evenly across the system. Meteorologist Ian Black joins us now with a first look at the forecast. And Ian, it's chilly and getting chillier. Plenty of cold weather to go around. Look, a brief moderation in temperatures over the weekend, but uh, it's not going to last. Where I mean, it's January, and I think we're going to set ourselves up for a good old-fashioned January by the looks of things. Again, tomorrow, blustery, uh, developing winds, uh, generally cloudy, cold. Um, Dress appropriately, that would be my advice. Kind of a split on the weekend, I think, uh, intervals of sun and cloud Saturday. Early Sunday, a shower or a flurry, uh, but temperatures will be well above normal by Sunday. And then, oh, does it get cold here to start next week? We'll call it a brief cold snap. Uh, okay, here's uh, what happens here overnight. A stray flurry is possible. Um, the breeze tends to drop off a little bit overnight, but I think tomorrow it'll begin to pick up again. Uh, gusting you know well over 20 kilometers per hour and with those temperatures you're really going to feel it again okay a lot of clouds a stray flurry you can hope for a sunny break here and there uh, winds picking up again uh, just that nasty combination once again okay low temperature somewhere around minus eight the high tomorrow gets up to about minus four or five a lot of clouds blustery, dress appropriately. Uh, we've got the seven-day forecast and a couple of weather photos for you coming right up. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Ian. Complaints are mounting against one of the GTA's best-known furniture and appliance stores. In the last year alone, about 700 complaints have been filed with the Better Business Bureau against Lastman's Bad Boy, accusing the company of failing to fulfill orders and claiming items are in stock when they're not. Angelina King has more. It's been a year since Christy Gray placed an order with a bad boy and still no furniture. Instead, her credit score has taken a hit. It's had a big impact on my life. Gray used the company's payment plan, and since then, a collection agency has been after her for not making payments on furniture she never received. I made a, my first few payments, um, but then I wouldn't make any more payments because it was like, there's no couch, there's no sign of a couch. I can't get a response on a couch. After CBC News contacted Bad Boy this week, it began processing a refund for Gray, clearing the debt and requesting the impact on her credit score be removed. But there are still many outstanding complaints. In the last three years, the Better Business Bureau received 984 complaints about Bad Boy. 70% of them were reported in the last year. It's given Bad Boy an F rating. There also is a pattern that we've identified of uh, complaints as well. And also the... Um, ratings being affected due to unanswered and unresolved complaints with us. Bad Boy says the pandemic is partly to blame. Whether it's supply, whether it's staffing, all these things. But at the end of the day, we're trying and we're changing as it goes. We've never had more inventory than we have right now. Bad Boy says most customers are getting their orders with no issues. But that wasn't the case for this family when they needed a new couch quickly. The appeal to Bad Boy was that they advertise online what's in stock and what's not in stock, and then also what can be delivered immediately. The website showed this couch was available and should arrive in one to three weeks. But after Jeffrey Foreman ordered it, he was told it wouldn't arrive for four months. Eventually, he says the manufacturer told him it wasn't being made anymore. They never had the product to sell in the first place, despite advertising it. Um, you don't take people's money give them nothing. Bad Boy says the couch was available when Foreman placed the order and is investigating what happened. Foreman eventually got his money back from his credit card company and Bad Boy says it recently refunded the credit card company. We're very flexible with our solutions. Consumer rights expert Daniel Chai recommends yes. buying big ticket items on a credit card. Because you're entitled to a charge back. He says without being able to dispute a charge, small claims court is your next option, which can be costly and cumbersome. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. Those 
Those are the images that shocked the world one year ago today as Congress prepared to certify Joe Biden's election win. Donald Trump told a nearby rally to march on the Capitol. Angry Trump supporters overwhelming Capitol Police and storming the building. Congressional leaders barricaded themselves inside and awaited rescue. And when it was all over, four people in the crowd had died. 140 officers were injured. One officer beaten by the crowd died of a stroke the next day. Several more would later take their own lives. While addressing the nation today, President Biden laid the blame for the violence squarely on his predecessor. The former president of the United States of America has created and spread a web of lies about the 2020 election. He's done so because he values power over principle, because he sees his own interest is more important than his country's interest, than America's interest. There are a number of remembrance ceremonies in and around the U.S. Capitol. Most of those in attendance were Democrats, while Republicans are largely staying away. In a statement, Trump accused Biden of trying to further divide America. He called it political theater and a distraction. In a separate statement, he accused the current administration of inept leadership, COVID incompetence, rampant inflation, and corrupt elections. With the wildfire spread of Omicron, the risk of getting infected is higher than ever. And if you've tested positive, then what? For the majority of double vaccinated adults, it means recovering at home. Health reporter Vic Adopia has more on what you need to know to get through it. And if you wonder if I hate you. It's how Skyla Selner started out the year, a positive test and typical symptoms. Sore throat, running nose, stuffy nose, congested coughing. The cough was probably the worst part. Lots of blankets. Skyla is isolating at home, managing best as she knows how. So I have on this table my Buckley's, which helps tremendously. Tea for my sore throat and of course lots of water to keep me hydrated and to get rid of that virus. She still feels miserable and wants to know what else she can do. Would cold medications, over-the-counter drugs, help with the symptoms at all. Something like this, for example, an intranasal cortisone can be very useful for decreasing nasal congestion. This pharmacist recommends common cold and flu medication, including ibuprofen and acetaminophen, which he says can be alternated every four hours to bring down fever. Some doctors prescribe puffers for people with a history of breathing problems. None of these medications actually resolve the COVID infection, but they have strong evidence for relieving symptoms. Once symptoms clear, he says wait 30 days for a booster. There's no rush. Because your antibodies should be pretty high and they should provide you with, with ample protection. Hospitals are worried about being overwhelmed by mild COVID patients who may infect others. For the vast majority of people, you can manage this at home. It's unpleasant and it's uncomfortable and certainly we appreciate that. But she stresses if your breathing gets bad, don't hesitate to seek care. Really, the thing that should drive you to the emergency department with your COVID positive diagnosis is severe chest pain and severe shortness of breath. To monitor blood and oxygen levels, some hospitals are sending high-risk patients home with pulse oximeters, which you can also buy, though people with darker skin tones may not always get an accurate result. Many emergency departments are also moving to virtual visits to keep an eye on patients while keeping them isolating at home. Vicadopia, CBC News, Toronto. Let's go back to Ian now with a check at what the days ahead will look like. And Ian, we can expect to keep our toques and scarves on. Well, get used to another uh, blustery cold day coming up for tomorrow. Um, and, you know, it's that combination of the wind and cold, so you have to dress appropriately. Here's the big picture. We're going to miss out on that snowmaker, which is going to hit New England tomorrow. Kind of a weak little frontal boundary in here uh, as it sags down we will kick up the northwest winds. So that goes by, uh, the breeze picks up again tomorrow and the temperatures will struggle. Uh, but some of that cold, cold, cold air that's been in the prairies uh, will swing in for early next week, okay? Uh, Monday and Tuesday look exceptionally, almost bitterly cold. Uh, and then, you know, the temperatures will start to moderate again. You can hope for a couple of sunny breaks tomorrow, but it's generally cloudy, uh, a stray flurry of no large consequence. It's possible, breezy, cold, you know the drill. 
Uh, and then on Saturday, uh, I'm hoping for a couple of sunny breaks. Intervals of sun and cloud would be a good way to describe that. Uh, temperatures will moderate a little bit, you know, getting up uh, closer to normal, which would be minus two or so this time of year. Uh, and then early Sunday, a chance of seeing a shower or flurry, and even milder. Uh, it's been gusty. They tend to die down overnight, but they pick up again tomorrow. Uh, gusts that could be up around 40 kilometers per hour in spots, so dress appropriately, okay? Here's your seven-day forecast. Blustery cold, still a breeze developing on Saturday, but the temperatures get closer to normal with intervals of sun and cloud. Early Sunday, a chance of seeing a shower or a flurry. I think late Sunday, those temperatures begin to drop back off again, okay? So relatively easy to take stuff here this weekend. Look what happens early next week. No big storms, a chance of seeing a couple of flurries. Look at the temperature. It'd be a struggle to get to minus nine, so you might most of the days in the minus double digits on Tuesday before those temperatures begin to rebound a little bit Wednesday and Thursday. And as I say, there's no big snowstorms or any major issues there, just, you know, that roller coaster with the temperatures. Let's take a look at some photos. Thunderbolts and lightning, it's a Bohemian Rhapsody. No, it's a Bohemian Waxwing. Thanks to Nancy for sending that in. Uh, in flight, kind of flitting around the berries, berries there in that tree. That's a nice looking shot, isn't it? And this uh, shot sent in from my brother, my big brother, Mark, who's been running the outdoor rink in Ottawa for 20 years. Uh, some of the best ice in town. And of course, the Canadian shot of the kids playing hockey. Get out there and get a goal. That's a look at your weather. Shout out to Mark. Thanks so much, Ian. And that's our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Chris Glover has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night, everyone.